Hi. The study that I'm covering in this video is entitled Sleep and Dreams, and it's part of the CIE AS and A level psychology 9090 course. The Dementin Kleitman study is one of the three which in this course come under the biological approach. A reminder that the biological approach assumes that our thoughts, feelings and behavior have biological causes and that these can be studied physiologically. In other words, that behavior can be understood through the role of genetics, hormones and brain function. Another assumption of the biological approach is that all people, regardless of ethnicity and culture, function the same physiologically. That means that physiological processes can be measured using machines such as EEGs and fMRI scanners. So studies coming from the biological perspective use the experimental method with scientific apparatus being used as well as controls to look for cause and effect. That's why the data so obtained are generally quantitative and therefore objective and usually reliable. Let's look at the background to the Dement and Kleitman study, which took place in 1957. A few years beforehand, in 1953, a researcher by the name of Azarinsky had identified rapid eye movement, REM or REM for short, and non-rapid eye movement or NREM sleep. And Dement and Kleitman had picked up from there. Also, as part of the background, we need to know that sleep follows a cycle consisting of alternating periods of NREM and REM sleep, and that REM sleep is strongly associated with dreaming. This diagram shows a typical set of sleep cycles over about eight hours, featuring five periods of rapid eye movement sleep, with each successive period of REM sleep tending to become longer. Which brings me to the aims of the Dement and Kleitman study. There were three main inquiry questions. Firstly, does dreaming occur during REM or NREM sleep? That is, does it occur only during REM sleep, only during NREM sleep, or during both? Secondly, can participants accurately estimate the length of time they've been dreaming? And thirdly, do eye movement patterns match dream content? In other words, do the way your eyes move when you're dreaming have any relationship to what you're dreaming about? There was one additional aim, which was, does the duration, that is the length of REM sleep, correlate with the number of words, that is the narrative, in a reported dream? To put it another way, when the participant recounted their dream, was there a correlation between the number of words they used in the description and the actual length of the dream? Now, let's look at the method. It was a natural experiment. Why natural? Because REM and NREM sleep occur naturally, although the study was conducted in a laboratory. Data were gathered in three ways. Firstly, using an EEG machine to measure brain waves and eye movements observation of the participants as they slept, and the self-reports of the participants. We don't know about the sampling technique used by Dement and Kleitman because they didn't mention it. Initially, there were nine participants, seven adult males and two adult females, but two participants exercised their right to withdraw and dropped out after only one night, and another two chose not to continue after two nights. The other five participants completed between 6 and 17 nights each. Before specifying the independent and dependent variables, I'd like to look at the procedure for this experiment because I think that doing it that way around will make it easier to understand the variables. The participants were briefed so that they knew what to expect. During the day before each sleep session, they were asked to eat normally but not to drink alcohol, which is of course a depressant, or to consume drinks containing caffeine, a stimulant. 
These were controls to try to ensure that the participants' sleep cycles were natural, or at least as natural as you can get in a laboratory setting. They were asked to report to the laboratory at their normal bedtime, also a strength because it helped to make the experiment as natural as possible. Each participant had their own room. Now, after they'd got into bed, electrodes were attached to their scalp and around the eyes. The cables were gathered together in a kind of ponytail to allow some mobility for the participants, and the EEG machine that they were connected to was in another room. The way in which the participants were woken, that is by a loud bell situated close to the bed, and the way in which their dreams were recorded with a tape recorder were standardized. The room was darkened, and as sleep began, the experimenter observed the EEG record and noted when a participant entered REM sleep. At various times during the REM sleep periods, the experimenter pressed a button to ring the bell in order to wake up the participant. If the participant could recall dreaming, they spoke the details into a tape recorder. As part of the standardization of this procedure, the same kind of bell and tape recorder were used each time. The same procedure was followed when a participant was woken from NREM sleep. All participants slept and were woken at various points. So the design was repeated measures. Now, let's look at the variables for the different aims. For aim one, does dreaming occur during REM or NREM sleep? The independent variables were REM and NREM sleep, and the dependent variable in each case was the number of dreams recalled. For aim two, can participants accurately estimate the length of time they've been dreaming? The independent variables were woken after five minutes, and woken after 15 minutes, with the dependent variable for each being the number of correct dream length estimations. For M3, do eye movement patterns match dream content? The independent variable was the direction of eye movement, that is vertical, horizontal, or a mixture of the two, or little or no movement. And the dependent variable was the participant's subjective report of dreaming. Aim 4, which was of course the additional aim, looked at the total number of words used to describe a dream correlated with the duration of the dream. There was no IVDV effect here because there isn't a cause and effect relationship in a correlation. Dement and Kleitman's data were both quantitative and qualitative. Quantitative with respect to the EEG record, instances of dream recall, dream length estimations, and numbers of words in each dream narrative, and qualitative with regard to the participants' descriptions of their dreams. So, did the data support the aims? Let's see. Aim 1. A grand total of 152 dreams were recalled by participants who were woken during REM sleep, whereas only 11 dreams were recalled from when they were woken during NREM sleep. In total, there were 149 instances of no recall when woken from NREM sleep. Therefore, aim one, which was to find out whether dreaming occurs during REM or NREM sleep, was supported. Aim two, in 51 awakenings after five minutes of sleep, 45 estimations were correct. That's approximately 88%. And in the 60 occasions when participants were woken after 15 minutes of REM sleep, 47 of those estimations were correct. That's 78%. So, AIM 2 was supported. It's worth mentioning here that at the beginning of the study, participants were asked open-ended questions about how long they thought they'd been dreaming. This approach was not operationalized sufficiently to elicit useful responses, so they redesigned the study with the 5-minute and 15-minute awakenings and with 5- and 15-minute answer options. AIM-3 was also supported. When woken from a specific eye movement pattern, 
participants reported a dream that corresponded to that pattern. Here are some examples. Instances of vertical eye movement included a participant who reported standing at the bottom of a cliff and hoisting things up and down. Another was climbing a ladder and looking up and down. And one was throwing a basketball into the basket and then bending down to pick up another. In the case of horizontal eye movement, one of the participants reported a dream of two people throwing tomatoes at each other. Don't we dream about strange things? When there was little or no eye movement, participants described dreams where they were looking into the distance, such as when driving a car. And in the case of mixed eye movements, dreams were about people talking or watching objects close to them. AIM-4 was also supported. Five participants were tested in this area, and the number of words used to describe a dream revealed significant positive correlations with the length of the REM period. Those correlations were 0.6, 0 0.68, 0 0.4, 0 0.71, and 0 0.53, all positive. Right, were there any ethical issues? Nothing major. One participant was told he would be woken only when the recording indicated that he was dreaming. But the experimenter woke him up or her up randomly during both REM and NREM sleep. So that was a case of someone being deceived. Nevertheless, in this instance, there are unlikely to have been any harmful effects resulting from not being told the truth. It was so minor. Now, to evaluate the study. Let's begin with the fact that an EEG was used. The use of scientific equipment such as EEGs in psychological experiments has many advantages, such as reliability, which is definitely a strength. It also provides quantitative data, which are objective, another strength. For example, the equipment revealed when a participant was in REM sleep. That said, the EEG couldn't measure whether a participant was having a dream or not. Perhaps this could be regarded as a weakness, although I think that's stretching it a bit. What about controls? We know that making sure that there are no extraneous variables in studies is important, thereby increasing the likelihood that the independent variable is the only thing that's having an effect on the dependent variable. So participants not drinking alcohol and caffeine drinks, eating normally, going to bed at their normal time, and various standardized repeated measures that were in place all contributed towards ensuring that the desired cause and effect relationship was in fact the only thing that was measured. This is, of course, a strength. But conversely, could removing caffeine and or alcohol from a participant who normally consumes those beverages disrupt their sleep pattern? If so, that could reduce the ecological validity and could be considered a weakness. The fact that participants were not told about their EEG patterns or whether their eyes were moving was a strength in that it could help to obviate demand characteristics. That is, if they didn't know these pieces of information, they wouldn't feel pressured to remember more details about dreams in REM sleep, thinking that perhaps this was expected. When participants were woken, they were not just asked to say whether they'd been dreaming. They were asked to remember dream content, requiring them to recall what they had actually been dreaming about was a way of operationalizing the definition of dreaming. And this raised validity, which was a strength. As part of the evaluation, we need to look at the generalizability of the study. In other words, can the findings of this study be applied to everyone? Or at least, can it be applied in most cases? The answer to this question appears to be yes because the data across participants were very consistent, which is a strength. But it could also be argued that the sample size was rather small. 
a possible weakness. The study included the use of self-reports, where the participants stated whether they'd been dreaming or not. The content of their dreams and the length of time that they'd been dreaming was also recounted. Now, concerning the self-reports of individuals, it's difficult to tell whether they were being truthful or not, particularly with regard to dream content. But looking at individual self-reports in the context of the data gathered from the other participants, anomalies, I think, would probably be picked up. In the case of an uncooperative participant, that is. And uh, I think that that's a strength. In any case, if you can motivate for it in the exam with logical thought, you're on the right track. Concerning quantitative and qualitative data, counting the number of words used to describe a dream and measuring it against the period of REM sleep is an example of quantitative data because it's measurable. And that's a strength. Whereas the descriptions of dreams would count as qualitative data Although, in the case of eye movements corresponding to descriptions, where the participants said that they had been looking at specific actions taking place, these correlations would, I think, count as a strength. Finally, let's tie everything up by looking at what conclusions we can draw from the study. Firstly, we've seen that dreams are more likely to be reported in REM sleep rather than in REM sleep. Secondly, dreams appear to happen in real time. And thirdly, dream content appears to correspond to the direction in which the eyes move. I hope you found that useful. Bye for now.